Hey everyone. All right, this is the first lesson in neuromuscular rehabilitation. Let's talk about some basics of neuroanatomy here. So first thing we need to do is we need to break down the nervous system into its divisions. There's two ways to divide it. One is anatomically. Let's take a look at that first. So we're looking at the anatomical divisions. First anatomical division, central nervous system. Okay, that's your CNS. And that consists of your brain and the spinal cord. Now, there's some uh, details about the spinal cord. Number one, it does not include the anterior horn. And I'll show you a picture here in just a minute uh, that'll show you what portion of the spinal cord this is. If it's the anterior horn, it's part of the peripheral nervous system. Also, the spinal cord ends technically at the conus medullaris, which is the space between L1, L2 vertebrae. So kind of right at L1 vertebrae, Right below that is when we then have the end of the spinal cord and it becomes the cauda equina, the horse's tail. And that's technically part of the peripheral nervous system. So the peripheral nervous system has everything that's not in the central nervous system, but let's get a little more specific. First, you have your cranial nerves. You have 12 pairs of those. And in the next video, I'm gonna talk about the cranial nerves. Make sure you check that out. You also have your 31 pairs of spinal nerve roots. Here in a minute, I'll show you how we define those and the neurological levels the cauda equina, which I just talked about, receptors in your skin for sensation, which are also called the somatosensory. Not only do you have the skin, but you also have your proprioception, the light touch that's obviously in your skin, and for example, your Golgi tendon organ or muscle spindle. Those are other examples of the somatosensory. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at how we define the spinal nerve roots. So in the cervical spine, it's a little different because we define it by the, the nerve root comes out above the vertebrae that it's named after. So C1 comes out above C1, so right below the skull, because right below the skull is gonna be your first spinal nerve root. C1 comes out right below the skull, all the way down to C7. So below C7 is C8, okay? We don't have a C8 vertebrae, but we have a C8 uh, spinal nerve root. Then once you get to the thoracic T1, now the numbers below match the vertebrae above. So make sure you can uh, understand that because as we move forward, especially in the spinal cord injuries, the level of injury is gonna be important, knowing which nerve root uh, comes out at which section of the spinal cord. Our other division, or other way to divide the spinal cord or the uh, nervous system up is through the physiological divisions. So on this, you have your somatic, which are your voluntary muscle controls and the somatosensory, which like I said, is like the GTO, for example, the Golgi tendon organ. Then you have the autonomic, which are your involuntary controls like smooth muscle. Smooth muscle helps uh, you know, move food through, the, through your body digestive system. Also, you think about uh, when arteries constrict or dilate, that is smooth muscle, cardiac muscle of the heart, and glands, re the releasing of hormones, totally involuntary. Within the involuntary, we can also divide it into the parasympathetic versus sympathetic. You get your classic phrases here, rest and digest or fight and flight. We'll talk a lot more about these as we talk about what happens when there's impairments to these throughout this series, but it's a little more complicated than just say rest and digest, fight or flight but that's a good basis to start, a good scaffold to build around. So since we're in neuro, now that we've divided it, we need to understand the basic anatomy of a neuron. And this is super basic. There are different types of neurons in the body, uh, but we're not getting into that right now. But what we need to understand is this picture. We need to be able to replicate this picture, so I recommend drawing it, so that you understand the terminology, the anatomy, and how the information flows through a nerve. So all the sensory starts with the dendrites. It receives all of the information. So here's all your dendrites or parts of your dendrite, the sensory, the fingers reaching out. Then you have the soma, which contains the DNA. So this is like the body of the neuron. And all the information is traveling down, down towards the axon. 
So after you leave the dendrite and the body of the neuron, now we're into the axon. And the more myelinated the axon is, the faster the information travels. So here's a picture of some myelin wrapped around that axon. The space between the myelin is called the node of Ranvier. So information keeps traveling down until it reaches the end. And then to communicate with, let's say, the muscle, it has to release a neurotransmitter across the synaptic cleft. Not synoptic, it's synaptic cleft. And then when the neurotransmitter gets onto the, um, oh, the receptor, sorry, on the muscle, then we can have a muscle contraction if it is ACH, acetylcholine. That would be a good transmitter to know just because it deals with muscle contractions for us in the therapy world. Uh, but there are multiple different neurotransmitters doing a multitude of things, and we'll talk about those as needed throughout the series. So we should know the basic anatomy of a neuron and how the information flows. So continuing with our nervous system breakdown, let's get through a little more vocab and then we can talk about some physiology. So we have our sensory or afferent, whoops, sensory or afferent pathway, same thing. And those go from the peripheral nervous system to the spinal cord to the brain. Then we have our motor, our efferent, that goes from the brain, from the spinal cord, out to the muscles and glands. And then interneurons, you'll see here in a second a picture of the spinal cord itself, a little cross section. But interneurons are in the central nervous system and they transfer information between neurons. There's some other cells that we should be aware of, for example, like astrocytes, which are key to the blood brain barrier, which we will talk a lot more about in the multiple sclerosis um, lecture. You have ogliodendrocytes, which help form myelin in the central nervous system, and Schwann cells, which help form myelin in the peripheral nervous system. And those guys also help in the reuptake of the neurotransmitters once they're used and help control the overall environment, kind of like with the astrocytes, same with the blood vein barrier. And the last little bit of vocab here, a nerve itself, when we use that term, we're going to use it loosely, but really a nerve is a neuron outside the central nervous system. And a tract, if we're actually talking using the correct vernacular, is a collection of neurons in the central nervous system. Okay, so tracks are like in the spinal cord going vertical to the brain. And even within the brain, technically those are supposed to be called tracks, not nerves. But, you know, a lot of times it's just general vocabulary. We just all get a little relaxed with that. Then you got white matter, which is your myelinated neurons, and gray matter, which is your un or less myelinated neurons. So they're going to, the information they carry is going to be much slower than the myelinated. Then we have upper motor neurons, which are in the CNS. Remember, that's why you need to know what the CNS can, is made of, what, what we would divide into the CNS so that we know what's an upper motor neuron, so that we will know what are the impairments we would expect, and then thus the treatment. And the same with the lower motor neurons, we need to know that, and those are in the peripheral nervous system. If you understand the central nervous system uh, division between the PNS and CNS and the upper motor neuron lesion, it's really going to help with answering questions on exams. So let's take a quick look at this is just a few things to start off with, the difference between upper versus lower motor neurons. So an upper motor neuron lesion or injury to an upper motor neuron is going to actually cause increased tone and increased reflex. And it will also give you the synergy patterns. And we'll talk about that a lot more moving forward, but just on the synergy patterns, we'll talk about, like I said, we'll talk about that later but we should be able to qu quickly attach increased tone, increased reflex to upper motor neuron. Up, increase. Think about that. Lower motor neuron, you're gonna have decreased tone and decreased reflexes. Learn that right now, memorize that, and then you can start easily applying this to some basic test questions before getting into the more complexities of treatment. So we've talked about labeling spinal nerve roots. We've talked about the anatomy of the spine. Now let's talk about the spinal cord with a cross-sectional view. So we'll start here with the spinal nerve. So I already got that labeled on here for you. The spinal nerve root rep is the yellow, okay? So it's, you know, it's the, uh, the tube that carries the afferent and efferent pathways. So the green represents the afferent or the sensory coming up to the back of the spine the dorsal portion, and back we also have the dorsal root ganglion. 
This is where you have a collection of uh, bodies of neurons, the sensory neurons. The sensory neurons actually look a little bit different. I'm gonna draw it in this little space. You have your dendrites, and it goes really far to then the body, and then the axon. So the sensory looks like that. The motor looks a little more like the original picture. That's how you get those ganglion. Also a fun little tidbit fact here is this is where the uh, chickenpox virus goes and hides. And this is why uh, you get shingles. Um, when your immune system kind of forgets about that, that virus or it's attacked for, for other reasons, um, and it stops defending this, now the chickenpox virus follows the nerve roots out and that's why you get shingles. So that's what shingles is. And that's why you'll see it follows like the, the neurons, uh, the nerves, because that's where it's traveling because it was hiding in the dorsal root ganglion. So anyway, that information comes into the spinal cord where it, uh, it can go up a tract to the brain or it can make its way back out or as information comes down from the brain, it's gonna make its way out. But here's your interneuron, communicating between the sensory and afferent, for example, in the spinal cord. And then the red represents the motor neuron and the motor neuron begins in the anterior horn. So damage to the anterior horn of the spinal cord is technically going to be the peripheral nervous system, which is a lower motor neuron, which then gives us decreased tone and decreased reflexes. And then that information travels out to muscles and glands. And that's your spinal cord. Uh, you should also be able to draw that as well. It really, really helps with learning. So now let's get to the brain. All right, anatomy of the brain. So first we need to know the cerebrum. Let's get a little thicker here. Cerebrum is everything above the black. Then you have your, I already have it labeled on here, cerebellum, which helps coordinate movement and make corrections. Helps with some balance and tone as well. And it's involuntary. You're not really thinking about the corrections it's making. And then you have the brainstem right through here. So there's your three major components. And we're gonna talk about the lobes and other stuff here in just a second. So after the cerebellum, we have the brainstem like I talked about. So the brainstem is gonna consist of the midbrain here in green, the pons and medulla oblongata. And really right now, just to, the only thing you really need to make sure you're aware of is that those are in the brainstem and that the brainstem controls basic aspects of, of staying alive, heart rate, and um, think of breathing, that's what it's doing. Also important to see in this picture is the thalamus and the hypothalamus, which is in the diencephalon. And that's gonna be right here in the center of the brain. The thalamus is very important because it is the relay center for incoming sensory information, which I have down here. And then the hypothalamus maintains homeostasis. Now I don't have the basal ganglia, which is a really important structure for us on here because it's really, it's a collection of um, different parts of the brain, which we'll talk a lot more about in the section on Parkinson's. But the basal ganglia in essence also helps control posture and tone like the cerebellum, but also plays a big role in motor planning. And again, we'll talk a lot more about that later. Now let's look at the lobes. And it's really important to see this, the central sulcus. Sulcus are the indents in the brain, the gyrus, are like the, the folded up part, okay? And why is the brain, what is it, what's the purpose of having a folded up brain? It's to increase surface area. So a funny little nerd joke is to say someone has a smooth brain. So um, I just, <laughs> it's just a funny, silly thing. But the reason we have it all folded, it's like you take a sheet of paper and you crumple it up. Now you have that same paper in a much smaller area. So the folds, the sulcus and the gyrus allow us to have more surface area developing a more complex brain. So don't be a smooth brain, have more folds. So the central sulcus plays a huge role in a big anatomical division. Anterior to it, we have our motor cortex, which is part of the frontal lobe. So once our body or our brain decides it wants to do something, whether it's have a gland work or um, to make a muscle move, the motor cortex sends information down. Now in the parietal lobe, posterior to the central sulcus is the somatosensory where incoming sensory information comes to the brain. After going through the thalamus, the relay center, right? All right.
And this picture here, if you pause on this picture, it'll show you a few basic things that you have in these uh, lobes, but I'm gonna talk in more detail now. So let's look at the temporal lobe. It's right beside your ear, so it makes sense. It's gonna be involved in the auditory. And then a big one for us in therapy is the Wernicke's area, or getting Wernicke's aphasia if you have damage to this area. And this deals with the comprehension of language. So that a person with severe Wernicke's is not gonna be able to understand you. Now they're also gonna, they're gonna be able to talk, but you're not gonna understand them because they're gonna have, the words aren't gonna make any sense. And that's obviously a huge communication problem. Also, you have long-term memory, visual perception, which is different than this, just the ability to see. So with visual perception impairments, you might have difficulty recognizing a face. Damage to this area, like I said, can result in language impairment, poor long-term memory, and increased aggression. Think about the inability to communicate. That is going to heighten some aggression. You have the occipital lobe in the very back. It's the red right here. That is your primary visual cortex. Now, this is your actual ability to see. Damage to this area can cause hallucinations and loss of vision. The parietal lobe, which is posterior, the posterior portion of the top of the brain. This is our incoming sensory. And it does it to the contralateral side. So the right parietal gets sensory from the left. Damage can, uh, to this area could be uh, something like anomia, inability to name objects. We'll talk a lot more about this in a less, uh, lesson that I'm going to have on the different perceptual um, impairments. So don't worry about that a ton right now, but you can add that in. Remember, just building a scaffold here. And then the final part of the brain here, the frontal lobe, the one that really makes us human. Um, this is first the motor cortex for the contralateral side. Right frontal controls left motor. We also have our Broca's area here, which is only on the left frontal, just like where Nikki's is only on the left parietal, and this controls the motor component of speech. So someone with uh, Broca's aphasia will be able to understand what you say. They also can communicate with you, but they're, it's really hard. Like they probably won't complete a sentence. They'll use a few random words. And in the lecture on CVAs, I'm gonna show you uh, what this looks like. Uh, and cognitive, this is like I said, the human component. Uh, it controls judgment, attention, mood, abstract thinking. All of that is in the frontal lobe. And a neat little fact, I think, is that the frontal lobe is not fully developed until about 25 years old. So it takes about a quarter century to fully develop the frontal lobe. Think about that in terms of what we do to our head as we're aging up until 25. We'll talk more about that in the traumatic brain injury uh, portion. So damage to this area, decreased flexibility in thinking, change in personality, and difficulty with language expression. Also, we've divided the brain into its lobes in different areas, but there's a left and right division as well. So um, the left and right hemisphere of the brain is connected by what? From old anatomy classes, the corpus callosum, which is actually larger in women than men. And we'll actually talk a little bit more about the corpus callosum and its importance not just with communication, but in terms of injury and diagnosing concussions and traumatic brain injuries in that lesson as well. But we should start to, you know, start looking at some of the things that the right hemisphere has versus the left hemisphere. And as we move on through this series, we will start to add those things. I think one of the biggest problems students make is that they try to just learn everything at once. Just get a scaffold. If you have some shelves, you can start adding books to it, right? So don't just throw them all on there. The shelf's just going to collapse. You need to have a nice scaffolding of shelves to start organizing that information. So don't freak out if you don't have all that memorized. And that is the first portion of the basics of our neuroanatomy. Next video is going to deal with cranial nerves and dermatomes. So uh, meet me over in that video. Let's check out some cranial nerves.